going to be talking about toys. Now, why do people have toys? God knows. They're fun to play with. Who plays with toys? Everyone. Dogs, yeah. cats, puppies, kittens, Babies. chimpanzees, Children. and human beings. Oh. Now, Elephants. nobody started making toys officially until about the 1500s. Until then, any toy you had, you had to make for yourself. And they would take things that they found around the house and they would make themselves toys. When are the first recorded toys found? 4000 BCE, in the pyramids they have marbles made of glass and stone. I have marbles up here and I made every one of them. Um, have you ever given a kid a toy and he's more happy to play with the box than the toy? Um, toys increase in complexity as you get older and they're good for high eye hand coordination and all that stuff. Uh, ancient Romans used pig bladders to play a form of football. They found in the pyramids faces drawn on pebbles and little paddle dolls with faces drawn on them and they had clothes. Um, ancient Egyptian, Greek, and Roman children had dolls with jointed limbs, spinning tops, balls, and pull-along animals on wheels. Roman children played with single room settings of shops and kitchens. Um, Greek toddlers pulled a hamax, which was a chime bar on wheels on a long stick. I had one of those. I've never heard of that. I had also had the thing that you pulled that popped the balls all over the place. Oh yeah. Um, Roman children played with bouncing balls, very sorry about this, made with cat gut. <laughs> Greek children had a marionette that danced on a board. You've seen those. Yeah, the, yeah. It's on a stick. Yeah. and yeah. yeah, I haven't been able to find one of those. Oh. Kites appeared in China and Persia around 1000 BCE. Uh, Phoenicians actually had a few toys that they traded about the same time. 2000 BC, 200 BCE, Hero of Alexandria made moving birds and figures using hydraulics. He'd have it and you pour water in it and the water would trickle down the inside and turn wheels. And he did that 2,000 years before James Watt developed steam power. <laughs> Toys were and still are made of pebbles, shells, seed pods, pieces of wood, fabric, woven leaves, grass, straw, bone, and water. Um, this is a real, genuine pet rock. Wow. <laughs> His name is Spock the Rock. Uh, war toys began as soon as there was organized war. Somebody wanted to play with it. From everything from chariots to stealth bombers. In the year 1000, Arabian kids played with toy birds that had flapping wings and model peacocks that walked and dancing men all using water power. In England in the year 1200, pewter, bronze, and brass were molded into miniatures, like miniature castles, and the kids had those. In the 13th century in Nuremberg, Germany, merchants sold artisan-made dolls, marionettes, whirligigs, and spinning tops. Today, the largest and most influential toy show in the world is still held in Nuremberg. Now, anything people made, they'd make into toys. For example, in 1760, to study maps, schools would cut up maps and have the kids reassemble them. This led to the fad of jigsaw puzzles. The educational toy movement started about 300 years ago. In the 18th century, they made moving dolls and animals, and this caused a fierce philosophical debate about the meaning and sanctity of life. You made a moving man, or you tried to be God. <laughs> as soon as you can make a toy, there's somebody to object to it. <laughs> bellows and valves operated automata. They used all sorts of things. Bellows and valves give us... Oh, yeah. oh, I love those toys. Automata... 
we're done with clockwork. Simple clockwork. And they've had those for the past four or five hundred years. Bowling games have existed since 5200 BCE. In 14th century Europe, bowling was wildly popular and they came up with nine pins. Well, the government of England outlawed it because it did not help you prepare for war, so why are you spending around doing that? The Dutch adored bowling and they brought nine pins to America. Now, so many people were paying, playing nine pins uh, in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and all over the place that the government outlawed it because it was frivolous and they were doing it on Sunday. So nine pins was illegal. So the people added another pin and made 10 pin bowling. The government outlawed 10 pin bowling. The people said, we'll add another pin. We'll outlaw it. We'll add another pin. We'll outlaw it. The government gave up. It never once occurred to colonial government to outlaw bowling. <laughs> I'm not going to make any comment. Um, in 1857 Britain, we got the modern bouncing rubber ball made because Goodyear invented uh, vulcanization. In 1892, toys were so popular, a two-act ballet was written all about toys, which is still performed today, and it is the Nutcracker. <coughs> Allergies were invented many years ago. <laughs> okay, as soon as a major invention was made in the adult world, someone would b hurry to turn it into a toy. For example, caltrops. Caltrops are anti-personnel devices that are used today and have been used for 3,000 years. They're normally a six-pointed <coughs> star-shaped thing of sizes from this down to this, thrown in the road so that a horse steps on it and becomes lame, a soldier steps on it and becomes lame. This has been used by every civilization you can think of. Now back 2,000, 3,000 years ago, it took time and effort to make them, so they wanted people to get them back. So they get the local children and promise them some bread or a penny to bring in the caltrops. Well, after a while, the kids got bored, and they'd say, I can throw this rock in there and pick up two caltrops. Yeah, well, I can pick up the rock in the air and, and have three caltrops. Caltrops. These are caltrops that became jacks. Um, so around the 1700s, they were starting to think about science and waves, sound waves, and waves going through water. So someone invented the wire helix wave demonstrator that was used in colleges and universities to show how a wave transmits. Anybody? Wire helix wave demonstrator. Um, gears on moving trains gave us the wheelo. I remember those being bigger. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, they invented something to clean wallpaper, and you just dab it, and all the dirt comes off. Silly putty. Uh, scientists, you remember the Big Bang Theory, which just went off the air? They had that big uh, DNA thing in the thing? Oh, yeah. And they make these DNA simulators? Yeah, well, maybe, but they're a lot more fun to do this with. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So you can have your DNA demonstrator and somebody comes up behind you and messes it all up. And then there was the European garrote. Uh, it was also used in India, the thuggies, and I believe maybe China, but I'm not sure. It was a razor wire with a weight on one end and a handle. And you'd wrap it, and when your victim came near you, you threw it around his neck and pulled with everything you had. And if you got it just right, his head came off. If you didn't have it just right, severed the jugular, and he bled to death. Toy? Yo, yo. Yep. Wait. Razor wire handle. And somebody saw that and said, Oh, Uncle Fred's dead. What a great toy that had made. <laughs> Some of these people you really have to worry about. <laughs> I had one of these, and I didn't have it in 1890. 
rubber type that you use tweezers to put in the little slots and you ink it and you could print invitations and things. Um, floor games were very pop, uh, prob popular, marbles, push toys. In 1850, the Cannon Rubber Company made multicolor rubber buckets, spades, and rakes for the beach. They made it out of scraps for their primary product, hot water bottles. Construction toys. Everybody likes construction toys. Um, Maria Edgeworth advocated rational toys uh, and bemoaned the quantities of mass-produced toys in 1815. Friedrich Froebel in the early 1800s made blocks in basic geometric shapes. The kids would play with them and learn basic fundamentals of geometry and arithmetic. Maria Montessori took that to a whole nother level of teaching you how to use math. And then museums all decided, oh, blocks are cool. We can do this with blocks and this with blocks and teach kids about art and perspective. I love those. Um, she didn't want to inhibit their imagination. But it wasn't until after 1900 that were professionally made blocks. And this was inspired by the massive increase in building in England after World War I. Frank Hornby was on his way leisurely to meet with a relative's children. You know, the kids are going to be there, I've got to bring them something. And he's watching an old mechanical crane lifting things up with, he said, ooh. And he got some metal scraps and pounded holes in them and made this thing called Meccano. In America, it's the erector set. Right. And he made a crane and a moving trolley. It was marketed to boys in the belief they should understand basic mechanics and engineering. And there were Meccano clubs and Meccano magazines. And it was a really big deal. In 1915, he made clockwork trains and an electric motor for the Meccano set. In 1920, he made the Hornby trains that were O-gauge. In 1933, he did dinky cars. Dinky cars were the uh, predecessor of Matchbox. Oh. oh. And Dinky made things up until the late 60s. The last thing they made, and I had it and got rid of it, idiot, was a USS Enterprise oh. made out of solid steel. It had moving parts and it shot little discs. Oh. <clears throat> In 1914, Charles Pajot of Evanston, Illinois was a stonemason and he invented a toy. Not a toy, but essential. <laughs> he uh, decided he tried, he tried stone toys and oddly they weren't that big a seller. So he got some wooden discs and he put holes in them and he stuck things in the holes and he put more discs and he made Lincoln uh, made Tinker Toys. I remember Tinker Toys. Frank Lloyd Wright made weird looking houses. His son John Lloyd Wright loved to read Laura Ingalls Wilder Little House on the Prairie and he adored Abraham Lincoln. So he got busy and made Lincoln Logs. And John Lloyd Wright was one of the biggest toy makers in the early 1900s. He looked into interlocking toy bricks, but they just didn't work for him. Um, somebody did try making some blocks, and they were sort of popular, except they were made out of concrete. Oh, gosh. And you know how when you were little you used to throw blocks at the other kids? <laughs> Apparently they did that back then too, and it, it just, um, no. No, it was like in the 1850s in England where they made little tiny pistols that actually shot pewter shot for children. Um, I understand that most children want their parents want their children to live. And most children want to kill each other, so you'd have to. Uh, <laughs> so, 
1930, Charles Plimpton of Liverpool created Bayo construction system from Bakelite. Do you remember Bakelite? It was that plastic that if you put it in the sun, it gets all icky and crip, you know what I mean. And he used metal rods, and you could put the Bakelite blocks on the metal rods in a base and build things. Well, impalement and mm -hmm. it's just no. 1937, the Premo Rubber Company in Hampshire made interlocking rubber bricks, mini bricks, and it was almost wildly popular if it hadn't been for Ole Kirk Christensen in 1932 in Denmark made wooden toys and animals on wheels. Then he made wooden bricks that were called Playwell in Danish. And uh, they went pretty well. And he's going around, ooh, the name I have in Danish goes with the Latin I put together. It was going great until the 1940s when he discovered polystyrene. And he, of course, had Legot or Legos. Now, Legos was unique. Every other construction toy was marketed to boys. Lego from the beginning was marketed to girls and boys. Um, by 1950, it expanded, exported all over the world. And then he had the add-on sets, specialty sets, and the Duplos. I'm currently doing a Lego at home, and I've got another four to do. I love Legos. It's like a 3D jigsaw puzzle. Oh, yeah. And it's a lot of fun. You get something pretty solid looking when it comes out. And this brings us to dolls. Dolls. Oops. Make a little paper. And we're made of wax, wood or linen, sticks wound with fabric, pewter, bone, wool, loofah, wooden spoons, <coughs> pegs, cloth, old shoes, clay, ivory, paper mache, porcelain, plastic, corn stalks, and drive leaves or grasses. <laughs> we have a beautiful doll that came, arrived at the museum this morning uh, that I believe is a porcelain or china doll that belonged to the Holstrom family back in the 1900s. Oh, wow. And we have two others from them, and they brought us another one this morning. So dolls are very popular. My first stepmother kept giving me dolls, and I kept taking them apart to see how they work. <laughs> uh, dolls made in Sudan and Angola in the 19th century are similar to those made 4,000 years ago and those made now. A doll is a doll. In the 19th century, there were flat, cut-out paper dolls with a wardrobe of clothes pasted over the body and hung from the shoulder with tabs. Paper dolls. Now, what ladies of quality would do is they'd make a paper doll with their own face on it. And the fashion designers in Europe would send paper clothing, and the women could see how they'd look in high fashion and order it. In 1796, actual dolls were sent from England to New York City showing the latest fashions. And the rich set would buy them and give them to friends as a present. Elegantly dressed dolls for the aristocracy. The first doll to say Mama and Papa was 1824 Paris. And it was an approximation, Little Bellows. 1875 automated crawling baby doll from Nuremberg. Then, of course, Thomas Edison invented a small phonograph that fit in a doll and had a recording of a child talking or crying. The clockwork walking doll premiered in New York City in 1862. In 1880, the domestic sewing machine's invention led to doll clothes patterns being widely distributed. Mm -hmm. And if you know the museum, Sonia Carr, she learned how to sew using doll clothes patterns. We have the sewing machine she used. Mm -hmm. 1901, jointed waist dolls were common in Philadelphia. By 1910, all joints were movable. The limbs of the doll connected to the body by rubbered cords. You hooked in there. You remember when your doll's arm fell off and you're sitting there with a little crochet hook and or you hand it to your father and say, fix it? <laughs> Celluloid plastic was very stiff, developed in Britain in the mid-1800s. In 1912, Rosie O'Neill used celluloid for Cupid dolls. And the nice lady who came this morning also brought us a tiny little Cupid doll, but it's very old and I couldn't. 
1915, John Gruel redesigned a tatty rag doll for his daughter Marcella. He was inspired by James Whitcomb Riley's The Story of the Raggedy Man, and he invented Raggedy Man. Very good. 1929, modern concept of fashion dolls came up to do the French designs, and France sent them over. Nathan Goodyear, the brother of Charles, who developed vulcanization, made an unbreakable rubber doll that actually bounced. <laughs> not, not a big seller. In 1934, a Hungarian rubber goods factory made hollow dolls with a whistle in the middle that sounded when squeezed. Not big with children, but dogs loved it. <laughs> Uh, celluloid, they, uh, it was too stiff, so polystyrene came in after World War II being very cheap, and you got a lot of dolls that way. Now, one of the founders of Mattel Toy Company was Ruth Handler, and in 1959, she was upset that there were only dolls for little children, and she designed a doll for her daughter. What was the daughter's name? Barbie. <laughs> so she did the Barbie doll. In 1965, we got Ken. Then came the accessories, the furniture, the houses, and the car. No other doll had ever had that before. Mm -hmm. They'd come with a couple of outfits and you could make your own, but, but Barbie comes with everything. Mm -hmm. 1980, yeah. we got the first black Barbie doll. Barbie is now available in 150 countries, and the Barbie company says every two seconds a Barbie doll is sold. Mm -hmm. wow. Somewhere in the world. Wow. And in the early 1960s, you get G.I. Joe in U.S., Action Man in Britain. Um, doll houses were found in 1851, very elaborate. Uh, the, movie, the TV show PBS, The Miniaturist. Miniatures were huge. Everybody had to have miniatures. So you would get a doll house to put your miniatures in. You know, you have to have a special doll castle to put your dragons in. Um, made primarily for wealthy adults, not for children. In 1911, the Germans began making flat-packed replica buildings that you would unfold into houses. And they would unfold into freestanding houses, and they had the paper cardboard furniture that went in them. Uh, they used hinges and flaps. The fold-out doll houses were popular in the United States, a series of grand houses named after U.S. presidents. In 1940, they made Sunnybrook Farm from fiberboard with a wooden tractor with rubber wheels. Then they had the Pillsbury Play Bakery of paper cut out shells assembled into a complete production line of the Pillsbury factory. But there was no food involved, so who cared? Um, when blacksmiths started to have trouble with horses, they went to tavern puzzles made by blacksmiths, available in taverns that you would sit around and do increasingly poorly the more you drank. <laughs> uh, tavern game, flipping coins, using a big coin to flip a smaller coin into something. Uh, the Rubik's Cube. Now this is a very unique Rubik's Cube. One, it's never been solved. Two, I bought this directly from Erno Rubik mail order when they first came out, before they got hit big. Stuffed animals. And animals made from terracotta. Uh, first they were wood, then they were terracotta for centuries. And soft fabric animals. Uh, the problem with those is that they were usually stuffed with straw mm -hmm. on a wire frame. You could not wash them. And the eyes were held in with sharp pins and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were... And the a fur wore out and it was awful. So finally they found ways to manufacture stuffed animals. And, uh, let's see. Toys, caps the ball on a string. These toys have been around for centuries. Wooden toys, which aren't 
as safe as they probably have them now all padded because modern yeah. kids, yeah. you can't give them anything that's pointy or hard to deal with. Um, kaleidoscopes, that came from the invention of the telescope. Now, of course, we have toys that are mint in box, which is a different kind of toy. Mint in box. No, you can't take it out. It's mint in box. Mm -hmm. We're not opening it. We're not playing with it. It's mint in box. Um, once the construction industry started doing things with sand, you get the silly sand and the play sand that comes out all solid and playing for. But toys have been in pop popular all through the world and all through history. And this leads me, I've done over 100 talks in the past 10, 15 years. This leads me to my very favorite story of any talk I ever gave in my whole life. This is my favorite one to tell. And I love this story. It is wildly politically incorrect. <laughs> that was in red letters, capital, underlined, mm -hmm. deal with it, okay? This is the story of the burden on the family and the useless nephew. Burden was born July 24th, 1847, to a fairly well-off family, all run by construction. The father owned a construction company, all of the sons did construction work, all of the sons' sons did construction work, the daughters married people in the construction trade. End of discussion. Well, sadly, a burden on the family uh, contracted polio. Mm -hmm. She was unable to walk and had limited use of her right hand. The parents loved her. The mother, Maria, realized that she was going to have to take care of Burden for the rest of her life. And no prospects, of course, because back then you didn't have any kind of accessibility or affirmative action. Burden, dear, we're going to keep you home and safe. The other children will make fun of you. I want to go to school. Oh, Burden, dear, I want to go to school. Okay. Burden wants to go to school. Burden goes to school. School gives us any trouble, we'll tear the building down. <laughs> we got money. And this inspired other children in wheelchairs to go to school. Sadly, education for girls in Germany in the 1860s was reading, writing, arithmetic, sewing, and home care. So Burden taught herself to play the lute with one hand and even gave lessons. She also was a wonderful seamstress. So she had her father set up a little seamstress shop for her in an annex of the house. And she was actually bringing in some money. Well, one of Burden's friends wanted, uh, it was her birthday. And she, all she talked about was the new elephant at the zoo. Well, the zoo was not handicapped accessible. Enter useless nephew. He went to art school in Stuttgart. He wanted to be an artist. He hated construction. So the family said, useless, you're in charge of whatever burden needs, whatever supplies she needs. That's your job, useless. You know, you're never going to make anything of yourself. So burden says, useless, dear, would you go to the zoo and draw pictures of the elephant? So she made a pin cushion for her friend. Pause to make sure everyone knows what a pin cushion is. OK. And she made it in the shape of an elephant. Well, friend showed this to everybody. And they went nuts. So Burden and some of her friends made elephant pin cushions. And they sold them at county fairs. And then she sent Useless off to the zoo. And she made monkeys, donkeys, horses, pigs, and camels. Burden had the gift of telling people what needed to be done in such a way they wanted to do it, witnessing her allow being allowed to go to school. In six years, she made and sold 5,000 elephants and other toys with her friends helping. So she said, I need a factory. Mm -hmm. So she wheeled herself into her father's office and said, Father, I need you to rent me a factory. You are a woman. You are disabled. And running a business is not a woman's job. And she says, my determination will help me leap over these obstacles. You wait and see, Papa. Well, a family friend named Glatz was visiting. You know, the court of guy you call uncle? Yes. And he said, you know, Burden, I like your attitude. I'll rent you the factory for a cut of the profits. And Burden said, deal. So she had useless running back and forth to the zoo making drawings. <laughs> and they were doing well. 
Then the uh, economy collapsed in 1896. Worldwide depression. The construction business plonk. By 1900, everyone in Burden's family was working for her. Uh, 1902, President Teddy Roosevelt refused to shoot a baby bear. And the picture was in every newspaper in the world, and everyone went, uh. Burden went, gold mine. <laughs> so she had been helping to develop a new fabric called mohair. And she made the bears out of mohair stuffed with cotton batting. Made their de debut at the Leipzig Toy Fair in 1903. Mm, didn't do too well. She should have gone to Nuremberg. Uh, but the Americans bought all 100 of them, and right before the fair closed, they ordered 3,000 more. The bears were exhibited at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair and won the highest honor, the gold medal. They sold 12,000 bears in 1908. After that, the factory was selling one million bears a year. Useless nephew, who had a flair for architecture, built her a factory with windows so it had natural light and with a ramp that went all the way around the outside. So all of her handicapped workers and burden could go anywhere they wanted in the whole factory. And she kept up a quality. The company motto was only the best is good enough for children. Everything was going great until a problem arose. Useless's son came racing in, Auntie Burden, Auntie Burden, they're counterfeiting our bears. People are saying they're yours and they're not. We've got to identify them. Oh my God, Auntie Burden, what are we going to do? And Useless says, I got an idea. Who can tell me what Useless did? Put a button in the ear of every bear made in the factory of Marguerite Stife. Oh, She's stife. And that is the story. Now, unfortunately, Marguerite, she became a multimillionaire, of course. Uh, she died of pneumonia May 9th, 1909. Um, factory, I believe, is still in stife hands. Useless nephew, Ricard or Richard Stife, died March 30th, 1939. He had come to America. He was a famous inventor and entrepreneur and himself a multimillionaire. The rest of the family was still working for him. <laughs> so uh, there's so many things you can get from that, but I just love that story. That is a good one. That is and a nice you can just story. see this little one-handed kid saying, I want a factory. Yeah. <laughs> and the father going, and after that, it was, of course, uh, dear, my division is doing very well. We've made a $500,000 profit in the last six months. I hope that's good. But you say, oh, Father, yes, you're doing very well. Thank you for a man. <laughs> now, in the beginning, common toys, items became toys. But now, toys are becoming common items. Robots were toys long before we really had them. Rocket ships were toys before we really started shooting them off. Mm -hmm. Holograms were toys and now you can see holograms pretty much everywhere to sell things. Um, remember Star Trek, the original series and the communicator? Mm -hmm. It was a Motorola scientist who invented the flip phone and he was a massive Star Trek fan and he was making a real Star Trek communicator. Mm. So this is what I have to tell you about toys and how they evolved and how now anything you play with might be real tomorrow. Yeah. You never know. And any questions? If you want to come up and have a look, you're welcome to. Thank you. Great. You like it? What is this Good. one, the Skelgro? Oh, this was made for me by a friend. This is a Skelgro bottle. She also made me a magic wand yeah. from Harry Potter. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. But they count as toys. And I, I have several kaleidoscopes. This is the most unique one I have. And if you want to come and look through it, I dare you to tell me what is causing the pictures. So that's it. Okay, up to the challenge. Okay.